Good morning. We had a lot of new faces with us this morning. We had a lot of students that are joining us for the presentation, so I'm going to ask those of you who invite a student if you'd stand up and invite your student. But before we start with that, we do have a new staff member. Where's Lisa? Right here. Okay. Can you introduce your new staff member, please? Uh, yes. Okay. Only thing I don't know how to do is move the slide. Stand up, Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. <laughs> Okay. Right. Or roll. Go backwards or forwards. Okay. Okay. Good. Click to make it forward. Okay. Perfect. And you can roll backwards or forwards. Perfect. Yeah. That's the only step for me. Oh, we have so many students. Okay. Good morning. Thank you. 
Um, and I have a you know, I have a son, he's there now, a senior there now, so a uh, great place, and uh, we're glad to uh, to have Dr. Carpenter with us this morning. Um, Dr. Carpenter has really been one of those people in our, in our field, both from a practitioner point and now as uh, dean of the college, but he was the department uh, head for the higher ed program, both at, at Texas A&M and now Texas State and really brought both of those programs to the forefront. They were good programs, he made both of those programs great programs. And uh, I think because he was a practitioner as well as a scholar, he knew how to put those two things together very well to make those programs very strong. There was, he was uh, interviewed at some point, I guess when he was uh, named as the Dean of Education, and I, I have seen the part of it, but I wanted to read just this one statement that he made about his involvement because the question was, how did you know student affairs was for you? And he said, I got involved on campus at Tarleton State, and he was a national president of Alpha Phi Omega, which is a national service fraternity. And he was a resident assistant, a hall director, he played in murals, and, and was in student center. At that point, he was a math major, correct? <laughs> so the next thing you have to understand, he was a math major. Those, change, those things changed my life and made me a completely different person from the guy who used to walk around carrying a slide rule and an actual leather holster on my <laughs> <laughs> to a person who was a leader on campus. And so as we talk about what involvement and now we talk about engagement, those are the kind of things that Dr. Carpenter experienced as an undergraduate that led to his, uh, his career in in the student affairs area and now in the, in the teaching field. So he's a, he's a, a great friend, he's been a mentor to a lot of us, and we're very excited that he's with us today to talk about student development theory, our 101. So, Thank you. Dr. Carpenter. Wow. <clears throat> well, uh, uh, as in, as in most things, uh, uh, my reputation gr is greatly exaggerated. So we'll see we'll see what you think after after this is over with. I do have wonderful folks in the uh, in the audience. The 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 little trio back there, um, very very interesting. You uh, you have hired some of the very very best um, to come out of our program in the last several years, uh, and they're good ones. And I'm 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 glad for that that they're here. So before I start. I'm not going to do the formalities of having a reference list at the end because it would just be too long and it's all in here anyway, right? But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a plug for this book except for a few things that are my own work and, and so I don't have to, to, to give uh, references for those. But most of, almost all of the material I'm going to do today is in this book. This book is the book by Evans, Forney, Guido, Patton, and Wren. It's called Student Development in College, Theory, Research, and Practice. And anyone in student affairs should have this in their office. Okay, this is the second edition book. The first book is a little thin one, right? Like two, 200 pages, 250 pages. And it was it put out in uh, the late 90s. Uh, this one, finally, they get the second edition done three years ago, and you can see this. And, and I know Nancy Evans very well, and she told me that the last thing they had to do, and what took the last year, was to cut 500 pages out of this book. So there's still that much more theory that needs to be put in and stuff like that. All right, so, so here's what we're gonna do. Uh, you haven't been in my classes before, those three have, um, and Donnie has, and so this is gonna be like a forced march through hell for a little while. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna, I've got, uh, as typical, I have about six hours of, of work uh, to do for us. Um, tragically, we only have two hours, which means I have to talk three times as fast, and also I want it to be interactive. So how's that gonna work? We're gonna find out, okay? All right, so the first thing we need to do is we're gonna talk about student development. Now, a lot of you know something about this. A lot of you know more about it than you think you do, but. We also, uh, the, the framework that I want to use is I want to talk about being professionals. Professionals, having a professional opinion. If you're going to be a professional, if you're going to have a medical opinion, if you're going to have a legal opinion, a, an accounting opinion, you have to have some content. You have to have something that you're going to have an opinion with. You have to have someone who, who you can talk to, other professionals who are on the same page as you are. 
here's what we're going to talk about today. Student development theory, and you can't do it in just two hours, obviously, but it's a start, right? If you don't know what to do in student affairs or in any profession, then what? Don't do anything. Don't do it until you know what you're doing. If you don't know what you're doing, then go get some help. Go have a consultation with a colleague, go look, read the literature, something like that. All right? You've got the slides, I think, right? Even though you can barely see them because they're tiny print. Um, so I'll let you read those things. We could, we could spend a lot more time on this, but um, this is some of the work that I've done on, on professionalism, on professional development. The first one was intentionality, right? First, do no harm. If you don't know what you're doing, don't do it, all right? The second one is peer review, peer review. Faculty peer review one another all the time. That's what we do. It's, it's the way we get promoted. It's the way we get published. It's the way we do everything, right? Because why? Because we want the state of the art. We want everybody to, we want convention. We want those things. We also want innovation and a lot of other things, right? But in student affairs, most of the work we do takes place in the dark. Most of the time, it's one-on-one -on -one with students in some fashion or with a small group of, of students we're advising or something like that. We can get better. We have to sharpen our tools. Iron sharpens iron. So we need to be helping one another and we need to be giving constructive criticism and that's the way we should set up our, um, our, our staff evaluation stuff. The third challenge is consultation and community as a challenge to competition. Again, I'm not going to read the words to you. They're wonderful words. I wrote them. <laughs> But, but it, basically, I was just ranting. I get on these rants, and, and so I was, uh, I was ranting. Competition has no place. Competition has no place among doctors, among lawyers on the same firm. Obviously, adversarial, that's a little bit different thing. Competition has no place. If you know how to do something better than we do at Texas State, you are expected to share it. If we know how to do something better than you, we are expected to share it. We do not compete for resources. We do not compete for anything, right? We help the students. It's the students come first, right? Um, and, and let's see, did I get it? Okay, um, professional accountability. This is, this is another rant. This is about the, the so-called rankings and all of that other nonsense. Um, so what we want to do with, about that is assessment and know what we're doing and have evidence for it. If we don't, before too long, we're going to be in trouble, uh, obviously. Okay? Outcomes, things like that. All right. That's enough of that. Whoops. All right. What do we know something about? And we're going to talk about some theory, uh, true theory, deep, diving deep theory stuff in a little while. But right now, what, what is it that we know something about? Uh, we know something about students' behavior and uh, the impact of college on students. There's a huge book that uh, uh, Pascarell and Terenzini, uh, the first book they had was The Impact of College on Students. They called it Moby Book because it came out in a white kind of a wrapper. Uh, and then it took them 10 years also to do their second edition. Um, and there's enormous, an, an enormous amount of work that's been done on the effect of college on students. Okay? College has an effect on students. Okay? It makes them more liberal. Uh, it makes them more liberal in their thinking. It makes them more uh, critical thinkers. It makes them more uh, uh, ha to have less religiosity. I didn't say less religious, but less religiosity. And, and a number of other things, right? In addition to that, of course, it enhances their income by a couple of million dollars over a, uh, over a, a lifetime, all right? So these are ca good, ca good things. We know that it does impact students, and that's a big deal just by itself. All right? We know some, some things about the psychosocial, developmental, and community behavior of students, including some things, but not enough things, about underrepresented students. We know some things about the cognitive development of, theory, uh, of students, including learning theories of various kinds, and their interaction with experiential education. A lot of you are various flavors of exper experiential educators in here, right? And we know how that interacts with cognitive uh, uh, theories a little bit, but not enough. 
The effects of several intentional interventions. We know how to do things uh, in, in the residence halls. We know how to stop vandalism, right? We know how to cut it down. How do you do that? What? We build community. We build community. We build ownership in the community. And that stops vandalism. We know that. It's been proven again and again and again. We know how to build retention. We know how to have retention and success in college. How do you do that? Engagement and involvement and living on campus for the first, some, uh, the first year. Okay? Those things are proven, proven fact. This is not theory. This is not something that we should shy away from when our neighbors suggest that they're going to have their child start at a community college for the first two years. I understand what I'm saying is controversial, right? And we're going to tell them that you are three times less likely to get a bachelor's degree then if they do that, as opposed to starting at a four-year school, okay? Now, maybe they still have to do it, and maybe for individual cases it's an okay thing, right? But it should be considered carefully in light of what we know, in, in light of what we know scientifically. Uh, from a research standpoint, okay? Um, we know something about legal issues, about uh, uh, our, our relationship to students. We know something about the financial aspects of higher education, an increasingly dangerous cliff that we're approaching in higher education. We're reaching a tipping point where people cannot get an education, will not be able to get an education because it's too expensive, okay? Um, We know something about economic issues, uh, such as the, the, the economic impact of higher education, uh, diversification in terms of diversification, training the workforce, et cetera. We know something about societal issues, um, something about, uh, not enough about, and we know some things that are very disturbing about uh, the impact of higher education on societal issues, because if the public schools think they're doing one job and then those students get here and we say, oh, well, they're woefully underprepared and we're going to flunk them out. That's not a good thing. We need to be talking to one another, right? We've got to do something better. Um, so those are some of the issues that we know about. Okay. We know something about social justice issues, inclusiveness, um, uh, our responsibility for change, local impacts on local communities, et cetera. We know something about professionalism and professional development, the really, really dull stuff, which is, of course, the work that I do. <laughs> we need to know a lot more about how to reconcile. Now, what do we need not know, but what do we desperately need to know? This is more interesting. We need to know a lot more about how to recognize, reconcile our institutional environments and processes with the needs of diverse population that are beginning to make up our institution. Or worse, are not entering our institution because of the low probability of success. All right, now, when I started school, 30-something percent of low 30s percent of the high school graduate cohort went to college, okay? Now, 70 percent of a much larger cohort of high school graduates. Not everybody graduated high school when I went to school, right? Not everybody, and, and, and one third went to college. Almost everybody does graduate, not to say we don't have a dropout problem, especially among young Hispanic uh, 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 people, but we have less of a dropout problem, despite what you read in the newspaper, than we have ever had in history. So out of that bigger group, 70% of them attempt some kind of higher education. That means what? It means people are coming to college that are unlike anyone ever, that ever came to college in our history, okay? It means the people that walk on this campus are not the people that the environment was set up for. So what do we do? Nothing. What did we do to prepare for these people? Nothing. Now, I'm talking to the choir here. The student affairs people actually did a few things, right? But the faculty have it. What do they do? They take the, the extraordinary action of what? Complaining to each other all the time, incessantly. <laughs> about how, how it used to be better. How it used to be better. Einstein was right. If you do the same thing over and over and you expect a different result, 
You are insane. <laughs> that isn't going to work. We have got to change our environments. We have got to make them more inclusive. We have to. We have to. Or what? They're not going to come. And if they don't come, what happens? This is how easy it is. Steve Murdoch has charts, the, the, the demography guy. He's got charts and numbers and stuff going on, but here's how simple it is, right? What happens when uh, average education declines? What happens to wages? They decline. When the quality of education declines, wages decline. When wages decline, what happens to tax revenue collections? They decline. When they decline, what happens to education? It goes down. This is a vicious spiral. And that's what we are in right now today in Texas. And until, until the legislature gets some kind of a clue about that, we're in trouble, right? All right. But meanwhile, what do we have to do? We have got to make changes. We've got to lead and we've got to show people how to do it. We need to know a lot more about the micro impact of college in a systematic way. We know that retention is a good thing, right? We know that involvement is a good thing, right? But what about the exact uh, impacts on exact subpopulations of individuals? How much involvement is too much, for example? What are patterns of effect? How much involvement is too much for somebody that's working 30 hours a week, right? How about if we figure out a way that they can't, they don't have to work 30 hours a week, so then they can be more involved, but, but how much more involved? And how much more for this individual? Maybe how much more for the first semester than the second semester, right? Maybe we don't need to be pledging people the first, the first year uh, in fraternities, right? Some people don't do. But maybe we need to be pledging twice as many to make sure that they get involved in that freshman year. I don't know. I don't think anybody knows. And I don't know how that interacts with certain kinds of subpopulations, okay? We need to redefine the notion of outcome measures, outcome measures. We cannot be afraid of data. Data are our friends. We can't be afraid of data anymore. We have to try to know what we're doing and, sh and be able to prove it and have evidence of it, okay? Uh, because if we don't, if we're not showing that the experience that we provide in student affairs and in four-year residential-ish colleges is qualitatively, fundamentally, quantitatively different from the University of Phoenix or the University of wherever else, the University of Dollars in whatever form, then they're going to continue to think, they're going to continue to press the, the, the case that Trading information for dollars is education. Or trading, in some cases, just degrees for dollars is education. Well, it isn't. It isn't. And we know that. But we've got to prove it. Okay? We need way more longitudinal studies of all kinds. Some work has been done, but not enough. We need more in ways, better ways of demonstrating our importance in enrollment management. We just talked about that a little bit. What do we not know but necessarily need to? We need to know how large our first year classes can get before the stress cost in more in dropouts than it's worth. Can we run a chemistry class with 800 students in it? I don't know, right? Uh, I'm afraid we're about, we're about to find out at a few places like Texas A&M and the University of Texas and a few other places, Texas State maybe. We're 34,500 now. We're forced to grow because why? Because that's the only way you can increase your budget now. So we're forced to grow or no one's ever going to get a raise ever again and we're never going to get new faculty, right? So we have to. We need to know why, uh, why certain kinds and categories of students will continue to be unlikely to persist and succeed in our institutions unless we lower our standards, whatever, whatever. Okay? Now, I'm given to saying controversial things, and I love to do that, and uh, I've been doing it for uh, all of my career, but let me just tell you this. When you're listening to someone who says that we need to raise our standards, and they mean test scores and class rank and quality of high school, which they typically do, then you are talking to a racist. They may or may not be an intentional racist, but that is the 
force and effect of what they're saying. Okay? They're saying we're going to exclude certain kinds of people who for whatever reason, structural reasons in the, in the schooling system, in our schooling system in Texas, do not perform as well as certain other kinds of people. Right? That's racism. Pure and simple most of the time. Ethnic discrimination at a minimum. Right? All right. Now that's another whole uh, 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 discussion. We could take a long time on that one. I, 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 in fact, I personally love to do that. But <laughs> so this is a, a you're getting a, a picture. Of, you can see my, my students and the former students are just laughing because this is bringing back horrible flashback memories for them. Okay? We need to know exactly uh, how much history or grammar or math, what could we, yeah, what could we know but desperately need not to know? <laughs> okay, what could we know but we need not to know? Because there's some pressure to know this. We need to, it, what we don't need to know, we desperately don't need to know, is exactly how much history or grammar or mathematics any given student knows in the junior year compared to the freshman year. Or at least what they know on the day of the test. Well, I mean, w at least within reliability and validity limits of the test and about knowledge that began to be outdated the day it was published, the test was published, right? We need to know, we don't need to know, we desperately don't need to know, what is the optimal flunk out rate for first year chemistry to weed out unqualified students? Go talk to the people in the chemistry department. Not different from any chemistry department in the, in, in the state, tragically, right? But they're, they're very familiar with this argument, and at least half of them believe in it. How many people need to flunk out? Texas A&M, years ago, I hope they've changed it, I doubt it. They would talk about, they would talk sincerely and, and um, uh, 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 in an impassioned way, and very proudly that they were failing 40% of their students in freshman chemistry. 40%. My friends, they're exactly correct. It's just that they have the definition of the word and the emphasis in the sentence wrong. They are failing 40% of their students. They're failing them. They're not doing what their job is. They don't pay me to fail students. They pay me to teach students. And if I'm not reaching 40% of them, whose fault is that? It can't be theirs. These are the brightest kids in the state of Texas. The smartest kids who have already succeeded by and large. But when they get there, and now you're going to flunk 40% of them out? That's crazy talk. We don't need to know that. We desperately don't need to know that. We're on our way to finding out, I'm afraid. What do we need not to know? What is the minimum education and experience we can get by with when we hire student affairs staff? What is the minimum? Right? Do we need a Texas State program? Do we need a Texas A&M program? Do we need people to get student, a professional preparation in student affairs at all? I am confident that this is making someone in the room uncomfortable because you didn't have a background in student affairs. You're not the only one. A very large percentage of our profession across the United States didn't have some kind of a background or academic training in student affairs. It's, that's not a sin. It's only a sin if you don't move to get the training and experience and the, and the information and the professional development that you need, right? It's only a sin if you don't come today, okay? Today, I'm offering forgiveness. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Whatever. Okay. How can we avoid these time-consuming and expensive professional development programs? That's what we need, desperately need not to know. All right, so let's go into student development theory. I better take my watch off so I can see it. All right, the definition. The application of human development concepts in post-secondary settings, et cetera, et cetera, by Miller and Prince. Now, I purposely left in, I could find um, uh, more recent definitions of student development if I wanted to, right? But what I want you to see is that this is not something that we just fell off a turnip truck and started using for uh, the, the basis of our field. 
Miller and Prince was, this book was in 1976, it was called the, um, uh, the Tomorrow's Higher Education Project. Um, I started graduate school with Ted Miller in uh, my doctoral program with Ted Miller in 1976 in January. I was a part, I was a full-time hall director at a small college in uh, uh, housing, men's housing director at Oglethorpe University. And